wow, I just, I wasn't ready. When I chose the parasitoid wasp as a topic that I was going to work on, I was not intending this to be a two-part episode. When I first began doing research on this topic, I was instantly flooded with information that I needed help understanding. Not only are there a lot, and I mean a lot, of documented species of parasitoid wasp, but it feels like every time you refresh your browser, a new one is being discovered. Keeping track of how they're categorized, what they're called, what families they're in, the different types, it felt like I was chasing a moving target. And then, as if it wasn't already bad enough, there was a newly discovered wasp that I came across named, wait for it, Idris Elba, as in the British actor Idris Elba. Actually... That was uh, my boss when I worked in Florida, found the species. Um, it's a platygastroid, so it's in the super family that I study. I'm not complaining, I just don't understand. The genus was already named Idris, so he thought it would be very cool to name it Idris Elba. That's Johanna Schwartz. She's a master's student at Ohio State University, and she's gonna help me understand a little bit more about the parasitoid wasp. And I focused on the taxonomy of uh, parasitoid wasps. So what exactly is taxonomy? Taxonomy is the practice of classifying all living things. It's the concept of biological classification. So when we have kingdom, phyla, uh, somebody had to define these categories. Typically though, when you're naming a species after a person, you have to add in a Latin suffix. So uh, for a masculine name, it would be I, for a female name, it would be A.E. And so in naming this Idris Elba, uh, in the description, he actually had to specify that this is a random assortment of letters. When I think of taxonomy, I think about mnemonics, like kings play chess on fine green silk, or kids prefer cheese over fried green spinach. No matter what ridiculous sentence you choose, the entire point is to help you remember kingdom phylum class order family genus species. That seems pretty fixed, so what does it mean to study taxonomy in the sense that it's the ongoing focus of a person's work? There are so many different species that are around, especially in insects, and we have not been able to name them. Uh, They've been collected. If you go to any natural history museum, you can ask. They have boxes and boxes of organisms that are not known to science. So are you saying that when someone picks up an insect, they go, OK, I know this is a wasp, but I don't know what type of wasp it is. Like, what is the confusion? Yeah, so exactly. Uh, somebody will pick up an insect and they'll say, um, I know this is a beetle because of its wings. I know it's in this family because of how its eyes are shaped, but maybe further than that, we can't know what genus it's in uh, because that genus doesn't exist yet. So they look at and compare it to the other uh, geni geni genuses. I'm sure there's a better way to say this. <laughs> yeah, you compare it to the other species around, and um, if it doesn't compare to any of those, uh, you might have something new. So are some scientists like, no, we should call it this, and then other scientists are like, nope, I think we should call it this, and it should be in this category. What exactly are they fighting over? So a, a lot of these um, categories, a lot of these species even, were described years and years ago by uh, old uh, British men, and they used it with their naked eye. They could only look at it and see so many things, but now we have high-powered microscopes, we have genetic uh, molecular sequencing. So we're able to look at so many other factors and find out that some of their classifications are actually incorrect and species that were previously described actually belong together. Of all of the things that you could spend your time studying, what makes a person go, you know what, it's the wasp for me? Kind of the numbers. Uh, there are so many, and um, I actually started this work uh, in undergrad. Um, I was working at a USDA collection, and the person I worked under was a hymenopterist, and so specifically, this hymenopterist was studying wasps. 
Hymenoptera is the order of insect that includes bees and wasps. A person who studies that order of insects is called a hymenopterist. So specifically, uh, I look at the sub, uh, the superfamily Platygastroidea, and so uh, that's a pretty large uh, superfamily, about six thousand species that have currently been described. Uh, they're all very tiny parasitoid wasps. Wait a second. Wait a second. Kingdom phylum class order family genus species. I didn't say anything about super families, so that's a new one. When you have so many families, uh, especially in insects, we like to group them together. And so all of those groups within the super family are closer to each other than they are to another super family. It's as if, you know, you were grouping cousins together. <laughs> okay. Together. These are my cousins on my mom's side, and then these are my cousins on my dad's side. So what's a day in the life of a person who studies wasp actually look like? My work mainly involves analyzing the presence of new species. Uh, right now I'm working on a revision of one genus, so a group of several species that hasn't been looked at in maybe 50 years. Uh, there's only five species currently described, but when you look in the collection, you can find so many other specimens of these wasps that don't match up to any of those descriptions. Mm. So I take those and I compare them to each other and I decide this is a new species. This is new enough to be considered different. It seems like there's so much work that needs to be done in this field. Why is it so neglected? What is the challenge in studying parasitoid wasps? Size is kind of a problem. Uh, most people, when they walk outside, aren't seeing these very, very tiny wasps. So um, to collect these, we put out these large traps that kind of look like tents, and they funnel the wasps into a little collecting container. And so by the time we get them, they're already uh, dead, and we include them in our collection. Um, past taxonomists haven't had those resources. Uh, those uh, old men from the 1800s wouldn't be able to look at these very tiny species of wasps. So they've always been around and we just haven't been able to categorize them until recently. One of the things that I'm trying to understand from the first video is why some wasp lay one egg, like on the cockroach or the spider, and some wasp lay multiple eggs, like on the caterpillar. Yeah, so between species, there's definitely a lot of variation. Some wasps will lay as many eggs as they can in their host. Uh, others will only lay one. Uh, and then there's also like an in-between category. So some wasps lay one egg, and that egg will split apart and make several children that are clones of each other. Different types of wasp species specialize in attacking different hosts at different stages of their life cycle. Some wasp species attack creatures in the embryonic stage. So what that means is that they lay their egg in the egg of another insect. So now that we know that, let me give you an overview of what happens to these self-cloning eggs. So a wasp lays an egg and the egg begins to clone itself. It begins to divide into more eggs. Some of the clones are normal wasp. Like they are going to grow up. They're going to eat through the host like normal. They're going to pupate and they're going to fly off and start the cycle over again. But some of the clones are just zombie soldiers and their only purpose is to kill other things. So the larvae that comes from these clones are very anatomically simple. They don't have all of the parts that the normal wasp clones have, but they do have some fearsome jaws and they just travel through the host egg, killing off other clones that other parasitoid wasp have laid in this host. The wasp laid an egg that cloned itself and also cloned bodyguards for the normal clones. So these soldier bodyguard clone larvae things don't ever grow up to be regular wasps. They don't pupate, they don't, they just are born with fearsome jaws. They travel through the host body, kill everything in sight, and then they die. Every time I think I've heard the most fascinating thing about the parasitoid wasp, there's more. There's a lot there that's just unknown 
and they have an incredibly cool life cycle. I mean, how many things get to burst out of other living things like alien? There's a whole bunch that are incredibly different. And if you look under the microscope, they'll turn out to have giant horns or uh, metallic colors. It's incredibly beautiful. And nobody's been able to look at them since we haven't had the resources. So there's an entire world of wasp that we can't see because we literally just don't have the technology. A perfect example of this is Andy Polizak. He took this picture of this microscopic parasitoid wasp that he discovered when he was doing research in the rainforest in Borneo. He had to use this special camera to take multiple images of this wasp and then put those images in a software that stacked them on top of each other so he could produce this beautiful picture of this silver, tiny little wasp that is just so tiny that you literally can't see it with your naked eye. And after all of that work, I took a screenshot of it and I posted it on Instagram. Thanks, Andy. When I dove headfirst into the world of parasitoid wasp, I started asking what I thought was a pretty simple question. How many parasitoid wasps are there? And Google was like, great question. We don't know. Probably a lot. And I was like, how much is a lot? And they were like, here's an article. And that's how I found this paper called Quantifying the Unquantifiable. Well, technically it's called Quantifying the Unquantifiable, why Hymenoptera, not Coleoptera, is the most specious order of insects. Like I said before, Hymenoptera is the order of insects that includes things like bees and wasps. Coleoptera is the order of insects that includes weevils and beetles. But the reality is this is really a fight between beetles and wasps. Follow me for a second. Back in the day when people like Charles Darwin roamed the earth, scientists were convinced that there were more beetles than any other insect on this planet. So it turns out that beetles were kind of like the Pokemon cards of their time. They're super bright and colorful, they have amazing fantastic looking features, and old timey entomologists just really loved collecting them. This is on top of the fact that like Johanna mentioned, they could only document what they could see with their naked eye. And they were seeing a lot of beetles. And as a result of that, there are a lot, I mean over 400,000 documented species of beetles. Then along comes this paper called Quantifying the Unquantifiable that's basically like, beetles are great and I'ma let you finish, but there are probably more parasitoid wasps than anything else on this planet. I had questions right off the bat. Right off the bat, I was reading things and I was like, I can't really wrap my head around what you're saying because I've never seen anything like this in my life. I don't have any references. I did what anyone would do. I looked up the authors, found one of them on Twitter and sent him a message because I am an investigator. My name's uh, Andrew Forbes and our lab is an evolutionary biology lab. We're mostly interested in sort of the origin of species, uh, and insects are a really good group to study that, those questions in that area because there's so many species. Um, and we're, so we, we work on lots of different systems and generally focusing on questions of diversity and evolution. So the first thing I wanted to know from Andrew right off the bat was why he felt the need to write this paper. What series of observations and thoughts led him and his colleagues to this hypothesis? Yeah, uh, so I don't actually come from a, a formal entomology background, but I had worked on parasitoid wasps for a while in my in my graduate work. And there has there's always been sort of this idea that there are more beetles than any other kind of animal. But anyone who works in insects knows that when you study the life history of any beetle, there are all these different species of parasitoids, so these parasitic wasps, that emerge from the egg and the larval and the pupil stage. And so just on the face of it, uh, it seems sort of um, not, not totally uh, well justified arguing that there are more species of beetle than, than other things, except 
that there are more species of beetle that have names. Just think about that for a second. You're studying one insect and waiting for it to hatch. But instead of that insect crawling out of the egg, a wasp crawls out. There are certainly some insects that escape attack from, from uh, parasitic wasps. But in general, like if you really study all like the entire life history of, of most insects and also like spiders and other arthropods, small arthropods, they get attacked by par parasitic wasps. So, so parasitism by these wasps is, you know, pretty universal. Are parasitoid wasp always married to one specific species of insects or do some of them attack different species of the same type of insect? That question is a really good one. And for most wasps and their hosts, we don't know the answer, which is why no one had written a paper like the one we wrote, the one that you're, you know, you want to talk to me about. Um, most, like the, the, the host range for any given parasitoid is not very well known because they're, they're tiny. They're hard to tell apart from one another. Uh, we've only really been getting good at that now that we have genetic tools over the past 15, 20 years. Um, and so, yeah, we, for most things, we don't know if they just attack one thing or they attack multiple things. Um, the more, this is sort of another thing my lab does is we look to see, uh, whether these things that we think are generalists that attack, have many hosts might actually be a, a complex of many different specialist wasps. And oftentimes we find that that's the case, that they're, they're very specialized, but we just needed sort of the, the tools to find that out. So parasitoid wasps are super diverse and super specialized. Is there any other insect that can compare to the sheer number and specialization of the parasitoid wasp? Have we seen anything else like this in the animal kingdom? Yeah, um, so I think the answer is, is that we don't know yet because we also haven't studied lots of other small parasitic things. So um, one of the responses we got to our paper was, yeah, that's that's all cool and all for for insects, but what about parasitic nematodes and like mites and things like that? Like we don't know. They they might also be really highly host specific, and we just no one's really looked all that hard yet. So yeah, in some of those groups, we might have this same uh, the same ultra specialization and the same high level of diversity. Andrew's lab also studies coevolution, and I really wanted to know exactly what that means in the world of the parasitoid wasp and its many many hosts. Evolution is all about who survives and who and who doesn't survive, right? And so. Um, Sometimes the host that the parasitic wasp attacks, there might be some variation for resisting that attack. And so then that individual is more likely to survive the attack, maybe pass on that resistance to the next generation. And when that happens, that's coevolution. So the, the host is evolving in response to the parasite. And then in turn, in order to survive, the parasite has to evolve to be better at attacking that host. So the individuals that are better will, uh, the, at parasitizing will also survive. And so you have this kind of back and forth between the parasite and the host. None of it's intentional, right? They're not trying to evolve, but, they're, but this is how natural selection works. And, and so that's the type of co-evolutionary co uh, things that can happen in a system like this. Speaking of evolution, there are species of parasitoid wasp that produce sexually, and there are species of parasitoid wasp that produce asexually. How common is it in the animal kingdom to have different species of the same insect that reproduce in such different ways? Yeah, so it can happen. I, I have a wonderful colleague, uh, Maureen Neiman, in my department who studies snails, uh, where there are some which are sexual and some which are asexual and they kind of can live right next to one another. It does, it does actually evolve a lot in, in the parasitic wasps and other hymenoptera in large part because they are haplodiploid. So mammals like we're diploid, uh, which means we have two copies of each uh, of our whole genome. Um, in, the, in hymenoptera, the males only have one copy and the females have two copies. And um, uh, 
I guess for various reasons that I'm not very good at explaining, uh, this results in, uh, in in asexuality evolving a lot more often in the Hymenoptera than it does in, in sort of more regular diploid animals. So does that mean that all the offspring of asexual wasp are clones? In that case, uh, sometimes they would be clones. Sometimes they would be making gametes that would come back together, and so there might be some recombination there. Um, in things like bees, where the the uh, queen mates, she gets one copy from her mate, uh, but then largely is just giving birth to a bunch of female workers. And those workers are then like, I think it's like three quarters that similar to one another because they get the entirety of a chromosome from their from their dad and then on average half from their mom so they're they're much more closely related than say human human siblings diversity in the gene pool is a good thing for evolution because the more variety you have in a gene pool the more likely you are to come across an advantageous mutation that can help ensure that the offspring continue to survive so what are the implications of asexual reproduction in parasitoid wasp when you zoom out on an evolutionary scale yeah i don't i don't know that anyone really knows the answer to that question there's there's an idea that being asexual is eventually a evolutionary dead end for the reasons that you said like you can't introduce all that uh, you know you can't keep hold on to the good variation and get rid of the bad stuff uh so when like bad mutations pop up there's no way to get rid of them because you're not you're not uh you don't have no recombination um and so there's this idea that being asexual is bad in the long run we don't really know that yet and uh, actually a colleague of mine and i are, are trying to look at that question with an asexual wasp that we study but we don't know the answer yet either new technology unlocks new horizons in science all the time so what new technology has come out that gets us closer to understanding the parasitoid wasp and getting a better sense of how many there are in existence there's this thing called DNA barcoding, which uh, the taxonomists don't like that much, and I, I think is problematic for some reasons as well. But basically, it's taking a little bit of mitochondrial DNA and using that to say, you know, these things are different species, or these things are the same species, based on how similar that piece of DNA is. It's pretty easy to generate that sequence, and so there are these efforts to collect just tons and tons of insects and barcode them all, and then at least come up with an estimate of how many species might be in that set. And those, I think those projects are great. They're getting us a lot closer, a lot faster to knowing what that number is. is. So what's next? What's the Forbes lab working on? We're actually now trying to look for other symbionts inside insects and try to estimate diversity of some of those other things. So we're making these big collections of, you know, just all the insects of the prairie, for instance, and using genetic tools to interrogate them from mites and nematodes and fungi and protists and bacteria and, and trying to get some estimates of how specialized those things are, which I think I'm really excited about it. It's, kind of going okay. We're, we've got a long way to go, I think. Major thanks to Johanna and Andrew for joining me on this episode. Go check them out on Twitter. And until next time, I will see you outside. I think there's too much news.